I'm going to talk to you today about the five steps of sanctification. Now there could be more, there could be less, I don't know, but I just went through and picked out five of them. And uh, I think you're going to find some interesting things in this study. Um, I'm going to name the five steps here. Uh, step number one would be salvation. Number two, the new life that comes after salvation. Number three, you have ministry. Number four, you have sacrifice. And the fifth one and final one is health, your health. We'll talk about this as we continue in the study. But uh, before we get started, obviously I have a new backdrop here. Uh, not really new, it's just uncovered, you might want to say. <laughs> this is where one of the bookshelves used to go. And uh, we're switching a lot around right now. And um, this here behind me is actually one of my grandfather's paintings. Um, just to tell you a little story about how this thing worked. Back in 1990, uh, we would have big, huge Christmas celebrations and all the family get together and a lot of cousins and, you know, all my cousins and aunts, uncles, everybody on the Denlinger side, my father's side. And uh, the Christmas of 1990, um, I remember Grandpa, um, he said that... Uh, he kind of stood up and, and, you know, okay, everybody quiet down. Grandpa's going to talk. And, and uh, he said, we were talking about it, Grandma and I, and, and uh, we want all of the grandchildren to have one of my paintings. And uh, we're going to pick which one you get. You're not going to be able to pick one or whatever. We're going to pick one for you, and uh, we want each of you to have a painting. And then he said, because this is going to be my last Christmas. And everybody, you know, talk about things getting very quiet very quickly. And everybody was like, Huh? And he said, uh, this is going to be my last Christmas. I won't be here next year. You won't see me again. And, uh, you know, a couple of people were just like, oh, wow, Grandpa, come on. You know, I don't know. Um, see, my Grandpa was a saved man, and he was actually a chalk talk artist, much like Peter Ruckman. Um, my Grandpa did evangelistic type meetings and things, and he would draw with chalk. And uh, he was quite an artist. And, this is one of his paintings here. This was 1981 he painted this. I was six years old when he painted that. And um, this is the one they gave to me. And uh, I have another one, another part of the, right over in that room over there. But um, this is the one I, it's on this wall here, so you're seeing it. But uh, Grandpa, I didn't understand at the time because um, he actually died right after New Year's Eve. I think New Year's Day, I think, is when he went home to be with the Lord. So we're talking within, you know, a week or two from the time he said, I'm not going to be here next year. He was dead within a week or two. Massive stroke, and that was it. Amazing. And uh, a lot of the old-time um, saints and things, they, they had a peculiar sanctification. And uh, I didn't understand because I was just 17 at the time. I remember it happening, and... And, uh, I mean, there was just no time to even say goodbye to Grandpa. It was just like, boom, he was gone. And, uh, but, you know, like I said, I didn't understand at the time why Grandpa was different in some ways. And uh, I know he was probably very ashamed of me at the time because I was a heavy metal teen and, you know, and, and uh, very rebellious and whatever else. And, and um, I know it, it uh, was a great sorrow to my grandfather to see... A lot of his grandchildren really messed up, and he was really a distraught about the world and the world's condition. That was 1990. You know, 1991 <laughs> was when he went home to be with the Lord. So things have gotten a, just a little bit worse since then. But uh, it's really something. But I've come to understand my grandfather over the years, uh, understand a lot of the peculiar things that he did and a lot of the peculiar ways that he had that I thought were so strange. Why would Grandpa be that way? And as I get older, I become more and more like my grandfather. Not because my grandfather was uh, somehow a heroic figure, but because he was saved. And he had these levels of sanctification in his life. And um, so I just want to kind of share that. I mean, this, this is where the old production area was, just over there a little bit. But uh, pretty much this is where I would, I've been making videos. So we'll keep you posted with what's going to be happening here as far as the new area where I'm going to be doing video, but we're setting up the bookshelf and all the other recording equipment and everything else. But uh, just thought that'd be kind of an interesting way to kind of introduce this video. Um, just showing this and telling a little story about my grandfather. 
as we're heading towards the Christmas season again, it's just always a reminder to me of a man that I look up to very highly. Uh, at the time, I kind of thought, like I said, I thought he was kind of weird. And now it's like I look back and I realize he was a Bible believer. He was. Let's begin here. Salvation, the first level of sanctification. You can turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, there's another way to say sanctification. That means set apart. Another way that you can say it's, you know, if you say what is sanctification, it means to be set apart. We'll see this here in the study. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You see, you don't come to God and say, I've made a decision, you're going to save me, and I'm going to tell you the conditions upon whereby I am saved. Uh, you don't do that. God chooses whether you're to be saved or not. All right? And somebody can come along and they can say, well, you know, I, I believe I'm a Christian. I'm, I believe I'm saved and things like this. But uh, it's up to the Lord whether that person's saved or not. I mean, I've seen, I've gotten into, you know, debates back and forth with atheists, and they'll get sarcastic, and they'll go, I believe that Jesus died for my sin. And they'll, they'll act like they're praying this prayer, and then they laugh and things. Well, they confess that Jesus died for their sins. They say he's their Savior, but they aren't saved. You see, the beginning of sanctification happens when you come to God and you present your case, so to speak, are you a sinner? Is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief? Is that your attitude? Do you come and say, I am a sinner, I cannot save myself? Okay? There's no amount of good works that I can do and continue to do to, to someday earn and merit my salvation. No, I'm a rotten sinner. I need a Savior. And the Lord looks on the heart and He says, is this person in that proper condition to be saved? It's up to God to choose you if you're going to be saved. And notice in our passage there, it says there, You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Okay? And you say, well, that's talking about ministry. Well, that's very true. Very true. But we're going to see here as we go through this study that you're actually it's actually a reference to salvation in and of itself. I mean, how many people do you think in the rich, powerful circles of the world, how many do you think really God's going to choose them for salvation? The things that are highly esteemed among men are abomination in the sight of God, and God's going to just choose them simply because they say, hey, I want to believe, I'm not going to give up my life, but I want you to save me. No. God works from the bottom realms of society up. The devil works from the top down. He says, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms. See, he lifts people up. God says, humble yourself. Bring yourself down. There's a big difference there. So when you get saved, all of a sudden, you aren't such a great person after all. All of a sudden, you're not really highly esteemed among men. You're not going to be running in the, in the circles of the rich and powerful, the, the elite. Next, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You're going to find when you truly get saved that your life changes drastically. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. 
But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. You see it? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Sanctification of the Spirit. What did Jesus Christ say to his disciples? He said, I'm going to, you know, separate you from the world. I'm going to, you know, sanctify you from the world. And they said, how are you going to do that? And he said, I'm going to send the Spirit of truth, the Comforter. I will send the Comforter and he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit of God will set you apart from the lost world. And all of a sudden, this book that never made sense any, any before, all of a sudden you're going, I understand it. Wow, it's just like it's right there in front of me. And I, I never saw this stuff before. Yeah. God chooses you. Verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. God will choose you. That's the first level of sanctification. When you get saved, God has called you out of the world. He brings you out of the world. He doesn't say, oh, congratulations, you believe in me. Just stay in the world and do whatever you feel like doing. You see, this whole easy believism system of just you believe, there's, you know, just pray the prayer or there, you, there's some that don't even say you don't even have to pray a prayer. Praying a prayer is wrong. <laughs> you just say, I believe I'm a Christian. You know, it'd be like me saying, I believe I'm a Marine. Uh, Marine. Have you ever been through basic training? I don't need to. I believe I'm a, Mar I'm a Marine. Can't even get it out. You know, it doesn't work. I can believe I'm a lot of things, and unless I can prove it, I'm not. All right? I'm a Christian. Why? Because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I called out to God, and He saved me, and He changed my life. That's how I know. I know now that God chose me for salvation. Why? Because He set me apart. He sanctified me. He took me out of that old wicked life that I used to have. And He said, okay, now you're mine. You're my purchased possession. Sanctification begins at salvation. Just gave you two scripture references right there. What about this new life? Let's keep reading. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read it verse 15 here. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Hmm, interesting. By grace are you saved through faith. Interesting. Given us good hope through grace. We have good hope, don't we? Yeah. Verse 17, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Hmm. So he chooses you for salvation and then he establishes you, he establishes you there in every good word. You know? And work. You mean God tells you what to do after you get saved? Sure. Sure. But you see, these easy believers and people that just say, I, I believe. Was there any change in your life? It doesn't have to be. I believe. You know what they are? They're Luciferians. Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's what they're doing. You say, well, huh? I'm not following you on this one. Think about this for a minute. God chooses who gets saved. So you come to God and you cry out to God and you say, God, please save me. Please, Lord. I don't want to go to hell when I die. You plead your case before God. You bring your case before God and say, please save me. But the easy believism heretic comes along and they say, I just believe. I, yeah, I understand that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. You know, I'm a sinner and we're all sinners. So uh, I believe. Yeah. Is there a change in your life? Yeah, whatever. It doesn't have to be. Well, yeah. They define salvation on their own terms. That's what they're doing. So they are in effect saying, I can take the place of God. God doesn't have to save me. I will just declare that I am saved and that there doesn't have to be any physical outward changes. There doesn't have to be a single thing of turning from sin or anything like that. 
I just simply declare that I am a Christian. I have believed the gospel. I am saved. I know I'm saved. I've declared that I'm saved. What about God choosing you? What about God telling you what to do with your life? You see? You see, Lucifer, his heart was lifted up with pride. He got to a point where he was saying, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend above the throne. All this stuff. He thought that he had the authority of God. Let me tell you something. If you haven't come to God as a repentant, broken, contrite sinner, what is repentance? Turning, changing your attitude, changing your mind, changing your course of action in life, and realizing, I can't keep doing this. As people get to a desperate time in their life and they're just like, you know, I, I can't keep living it like this. I can't keep getting drunk and getting in accidents and I can't keep uh, fornicating or, or can't keep looking at pornography or I can't keep whatever. I can't keep this up. I need help. Somebody says, are you a sinner? Yes, I'm a sinner. You see, you come to God in that repentant state, broken. You're not coming with any righteousness of your own. You're not coming and saying, hey, I think I can get by and I th I'm a pretty good person. No, no, <laughs> you're broken. That's why tears almost always will accompany a true salvation. All right. You don't have to wait till your life is totally wrecked. I mean, you can get saved before you totally wreck your life. But uh, most people, they'll go into sin for a little while, you know, and there's some agony associated with your salvation. There's some, there's some, uh, man, I, I can't believe it. I got, I got to have help and whatever. What's contrition? Contrition, a contrite spirit. Somebody that is broken and saying, I know I've messed up. I know I need to change. I feel I've wronged God. When they hear, you know, God's word and the conviction comes in and they realize I've sinned, I've lied, I've stolen, I've blasphemed God, I've, I've this, I've that, and they feel like, oh man, I've sinned against a holy, righteous God. That's contrition. And when you come in that state, when you come like that, God then looks at your heart and he says, okay, you're in, or sorry. But I want you to notice three things here, okay? Number one, verse 15 there. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Do you do that when you're lost? No. Stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. All of a sudden, you're going to find yourself taking stands that you would have never dreamed of taking back in your lost life. All of a sudden, you're going to be real worried about people messing with the King James Bible or whatever the equivalent is in your language. You're going to start thinking about end times types of things, and you're going to start thinking about people going to hell. And Wait a second. Roman Catholicism teaches that Mary is somehow a mediator between or mediatrix between, you know, Jesus and, and man and things. And you got to go to the priest and you got to go to here. And you're going to start to think about spiritual things like you never did before. Something changes. And I maintain and will maintain to the day of my death or being called up that most people in these church buildings are lost. All right. Why? They don't want to talk about the things of the Lord. They don't want to hold fast. They'll talk about the same things that the people out in the world talk about. You end with the average church building on a Sunday morning and talk, listen to the conversations and go down to the local gas station. It's the same conversations. Oh, Donald Trump just got elected. What do you think he's going to do? How do you think he's going to do for the president? Boy, I heard there's going to be a lot of snow this weekend. Did you get your Christmas shopping done? Hey, da, 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 da. Yeah. When you get truly saved, you will, will take stands and you will want to talk about Jesus Christ. Take stands that you wouldn't have done in your lost life. Number two, you will change your life to conform to the Bible. You will. This is the way it's going to be. And you will be established by God in understanding Scripture. And look at verse 17. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You will do meet works meet for repentance, the Bible talks about. 
all of a sudden you'll find yourself wanting to do things for the Lord that you can't even explain. Why do I start feeling like this? And I want to, I want to tell people about Jesus and I want to read my Bible and I want to pray and I want to start cleaning up my life and I got to go through my movies and, and see which ones I should keep and which ones I should throw out. Maybe I ought to throw them all out. And, and, mm -hmm. Yeah. All of a sudden, your interests are going to change at true salvation. And you say, what is that? Uh, sanctification. God sets you apart. He takes you out of the world and says, you're mine now. You're my purchased possession. And I'm going to give you a new life. And that new life is going to further separate you from the world. Everybody that gets saved, every single person that gets saved, will do stupid things right after their salvation. Why? They're a babe in Christ. Do you ever see a baby? They put dumb things in their mouth. Pick up something, you know. I remember this, uh, my one cousin of mine years and years ago, she had a little baby boy and stuff, and he's, you know, walking around the back, you know, porch at the house where I grew up, and he sees this spider, daddy long leg or big long leg thing, and he and he's looking at the thing, and he goes, and grabs it, and goes, pops it right in his mouth, and, you know, my cousin's like, ah, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> you know, don't do that. That's what babies do. You know, as a baby Christian, you're going to do that kind of stuff. You're going to believe things that are lies. You're going to do some really dumb things. What are you doing? What's happening? God saved you. First level of sanctification. Now the second level of sanctification is He's going to start teaching you things. And you're going to go, wait a second, I was using a new version when I first got, oh man, I didn't know that. And the Lord's like, yeah, it's okay. Use the King James. There's a pre-trib rapture? I didn't know that. Whoa, man, I heard some good arguments for it and stuff, and I used to believe that we're going to go into this time. And Whoa, you know, the Lord's going to show you stuff. And you start reading the Bible, and you go, it doesn't make any sense. This part here doesn't seem to line up with that part there. And How do we mesh everything together in the Bible? And then you hear about dispensational teaching, and you go, oh, there it is, you know. And on and on and on and on and on. Sanctification, that new life that comes in. And all of a sudden, you're going to say, hey, you know what? I used to get down there and I used to smoke and I used to drink and I used to do this and I used to do that. And now the Lord's convicted me and I'm slowly, I don't say salvation happens and you go, boom, all bad habits are gone. Of course not. Give me a break. I don't teach that. Never have. Although the liars like to say I have. Ask them for proof. They can't provide any, but whatever. You know, you'll start to see your life cleaning up. That new life. Gradually, you will learn more and more and more things. You'll understand the scriptures better. You'll understand things in your life better. Sanctification. First Peter chapter 4. Turn over to there. First Peter chapter 4. It's a good one. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Hmm. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wicked, past, lost life. Look what happens here. I love this one. Verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Hmm. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Everybody's going to answer someday. But isn't it interesting that those people that you used to hang out with back when you were lost, all of a sudden they go, what on earth happened to Brian? <laughs> he used to be really cool. I mean, the guy used to be like really hardcore into motorcycles and he was fun to be around and stuff. Now he's like into this, what is it, ministry or something? The guy, the, huh? Told the best friend, uh, my best friend I had growing up, the one time he's like, so what are you up to? And, you know, talked to him. Last time I talked to him was years ago. And I said, I'm studying the Bible. And he laughed. Thought that was funny. But, you know, I'm somewhat sympathetic because the man I used to be uh, would not have studied the Bible. Things changed. 
You say, what is that? Sanctification. It doesn't want to hang out anymore. It's strange that I don't run to the same excess of riot. Last time that was, I talked to him on the phone. Last time before that that I saw him, he was uh, talking about how him and his wife had gone to Las Vegas to watch a topless show. Married man. Watching a topless show with his wife sitting right there. It's normal, isn't it? Not when you're saved. Nope. Not when you're saved. And they go to church. Sure. Raised in church. Same church I went to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about that? And how many of you out there can say the same things? Yeah, I used to do this, and I used to do that, and I used to have these friends and things, and all of a sudden now they're going, they think you're strange. Verse 4, Wherefore they think it's strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. It's not just that they say you're strange. Now they actually speak evil of you. Did you, did you hear about Brian? He's into some kind of cult stuff. I don't know What's the thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He holds to the King James Bible. All others are satanic. The guy, the guy says the Vatican's behind everything. I mean, he's. I think he's either been out in the sun too long, or he works too hard, or I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> if you're newly saved, you're going to get it. You're going to understand. You know, back when I first got saved, I was... I'll tell you a little thing here. I think I've said this in other studies, but back when I first got saved, just to tell you how bad things were, I was actually saying that Catholics, Roman Catholics and Jews that reject Jesus, I was saying that uh, they're saved. I was saying that there's probably more than one way to heaven. <laughs> That's how bad I was when I first got saved. I was putting a lot of uh, things in my mouth as a baby Christian. Or rather, maybe things were coming out of my mouth as a baby Christian. It was bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I go over this verse and over this verse and over this verse, and this is the one that I get accused of. People say, you're teaching lordship salvation. Uh, it's so ridiculous. I mean, I, I get this thing all the time from these satanic, easy believism people, the people that just save themselves according to their own thoughts and beliefs. Um, there's no outward signs, no, no need of repentance, uh, no change of attitude towards their sin. They just decide that they're saved. They proclaim that they're saved, and they're saved. <laughs> you know? Wow, amazing. But uh, the scripture there puts a conditional clause into the thing. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There is a changed life that will accompany a true conversion. I mean, it's just common sense. I don't understand how people cannot get that. It doesn't mean that you become sinlessly perfect. It doesn't mean that you have to continue in good works to maintain your salvation. It doesn't mean that at all. It means at a true conversion where you've come to Jesus Christ and, and the Lord saves you, He chooses you, He looks at your heart condition and He says, that's real. This person's going to live for me. They're not going to be perfect. They're not going to be sinless. Only God is sinless, okay? Only the Lord Jesus Christ, when He was here on the earth, God manifested in the flesh. He was perfect. He was sinless. Nobody else can do it. But the whole point is, there will be a changed life there. God's going to tell you what to do. Why? Because you're His purchased possession. It's very, very simple. He will sanctify you by giving you that new life that will further set you apart from the rest of the world. Number three, let's go on to the next one. How about ministry? All right. He saves you. That separates you from the lost world. Then as a separate 
person. You're now a new creature in Christ Jesus, and the Lord starts to sanctify you and starts to move you in the right direction and say, okay, give that up. Don't put that in your mouth. You know, it's just like a little baby, and he's just swatting your hand saying, stop doing that. Quit your temper fit. Come on, get that out of your mouth. Eat this. Put that in your mouth. He's the process of sanctification. And at some point in time, the Lord says, okay, now you're ready for some responsibility. Now, here, take the spoon. Feed yourself. Little boy, little girl. Feed yourself. Hey, um, I want you to pick this thing up here and bring it to me. I have a two-year-old right now. I understand. <laughs> okay? Um, yeah. That's what the Lord will do. And when He starts to give you opportunities for witnessing and for ministry, that's a good thing. He's seeing some good progress there in your sanctification and you cleaning up your life and you taking care of things when He tells you to do something you obey. You know, it's not a very fun thing when you tell a child, hey, stop doing that, and they disobey. And you have to tell them again and again and again. You give them a spanking and you say, now please stop doing it. And they stop doing it for a while and they go back to doing it again. And you... It's a wonderful thing when you have an obedient child and that child you say, don't do that. And that child, okay, you know, and they don't do it again. That's a good thing. That's the way we should be as Christians. But let's see here about this thing of ministry. Verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 through 21. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Sanctified. The Lord says, hey, I set you apart. I've taken you from the world and I've put you down into a position now that you're one of my children. You're now my property. You've been sanctified from that lost world. Now I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you truth. And now, son, daughter, I'm going to start to give you some responsibility. You're to that point. You are now an ambassador. And I have given you the word of reconciliation. There it is. That, right there, is the next step in sanctification. But let's keep reading here. Chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. He helped thee. That's what succor means. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're lost, you need to take heed of that. Now is the time for you to be saved. Don't wait. Verse 3, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. You see there? By love unfeigned, by the word of truth. By the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report. They think it's strange that you run not to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. You see it? And good report, as deceivers, and yet true. It doesn't say as deceivers sometimes, but you know you try to be true once in a while too. Uh-uh. You are being called a deceiver by the lost world, by the false professing Christians. He's a liar. Why do you hear him? Mm -hmm. What they say about Jesus? He's mad. Why hear ye him? 
He has a devil. This is, you know, you know this guy's uh, Beelzebub and things like this. Mm -hmm. They were calling him a deceiver, and yet he was truth. Jesus Christ was truth. You know, is truth. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't get any more true than Jesus Christ. Well, we are his servants. We are his ambassadors. He's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see how it works? You will be called a deceiver. You will be slandered. You will be mocked and put down. Verse 9. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always, always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. You go down through that list there and you, you examine yourself, you look at your life and you say, you know, these things that get me down sometimes and make me feel kind of depressed and whatever else. Well, if they're in that list there, you're doing right. And it's not that, you know, you just got to live this terrible, horrible life down here. It's not terrible. It's not horrible. We're going to see that in a little bit as we continue. It's uh, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit of God. That's a wonderful thing to know that you are counted worthy to suffer shame for Jesus Christ. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain, gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. We'll see more on that later. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. That's one of those things that is, you can read it and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> that's part of the thing of sanctification that's not always fun to think about. Um, God is going to put you through things so that you can minister to other people. God's saints do not sit on satin pillows down here on this earth. Uh, God expects you to be in the trenches, to have depression problems, to have health problems, to have financial problems, to understand different things, different people, different ways of, you know, whatever. Why? So you can minister to them. And I've said this point before in other studies. Paul does not say in verse 22, I make myself all things that I can win other people. Uh, -uh. I am made. And these modern professing Christians, they'll say, you know, well, I'm going to be like, you know, the Romans to win the Romans or something like this. No, no, no. They'll say, you know, we're going to play rock music with Christian lyrics so that we can win people that are into rock music. That's not what the text is saying. Not at all. I mean, these people. What the Lord is doing there is He's saying, as part of the sanctification process, I am going to put you through experiences so that people can relate to you when you talk about your testimony. And you can go and you can help people in their situation. Yeah. That's part of the sanctification process. Now let me ask you a question. How quickly can that happen? Well, the Lord can put you through some things pretty quickly, and you can have some interesting life experiences when you first get saved. But uh, a lot of what you're going to go through as a Christian, it's going to take a lifetime. You're going to go through things. The Lord's going to put you in situations uh, the whole way through until the end of your life, be it death or the rapture. Yeah, what is it? Sanctification. You see, ministry is an ongoing thing. You see, sanctification that starts with your salvation, that's over. 
you don't have to continue to be sanctified to stay saved or something. No, 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 no. When you get saved, that sanctification, that setting apart where the Lord takes you from the lost world and brings you over into His family and says, okay, you're one of my children now. I've purchased you. That's a one-time event. You can't get saved and resaved and resaved, in spite of what some of the people out there think. Um, that's one time. The new creature in Christ Jesus, that kind of continues. Most of that's going to happen, that early sanctification. The Lord's cleaning things up in your life and you're doing really dumb things and the Lord's correcting you and saying, no, no, no. You'll grow up as a Christian and you aren't going to make those same mistakes that you made early on when you first got saved. You get through that level of sanctification. And there's still going to be some things that the Lord's going to have to correct you on. we are going to act like a bit of a baby in the future, you know, as an adult Christian. Um, but most of that sanctification is going to be shortly after you get saved. Uh, but the third one there, ministry, that's something that's going to continue as time goes by. You're going to continually need that sanctification process where the Lord's going to make, be making you into all things, going to put you through experiences. Okay? Now let's go on to number four. What about sacrifice? How does that relate to sanctification? Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says here, I beseech you, uh, yeah, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye, may, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're going to see about the thing of perfect a little bit later on here, how it ties into weakness. But um, we're supposed to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, ministry is not always a sacrifice. There will be times when you're just out doing your thing. You're out shopping. You know, I had this happen. Talked about this in one of my previous videos. Out shopping the one night, and this woman just walks up to me and she goes, "Here's some, you know, truth. Uh, it's a, a little thing that you can look up. A website that you can look up that'll show you some truth." And I look down. It's like jw.org, and I'm like, "Well, here we go." <laughs> you know. Thank you, Lord. Opportunity to witness. Um, and I got to witness to her and things and, and uh, you know, had a good time doing it. Um, it wasn't really much of a sacrifice. I'm out doing food, you know, grocery shopping with my wife and son. You know, it was fun. But uh, there's other times that the Lord will put you into a situation where He wants you to do something uh, ministry-wise, um, and it's a sacrifice. Um, I want to tell you a little story here about the thing of sacrifice, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. Uh, back when I first went into ministry, I was really unsure, you know, kind of like, is this what the Lord wants me to do? You know, well, I guess I'll try it. And if it fails, then I can say, hey, he didn't want me to be in ministry so I can go back to the secular world and work, you know, doing whatever. And that didn't happen, you know. And uh, I love the Lord very much. I love serving Him. To, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm speaking somewhat in jest here, but you know, uh, it's rough sometimes. I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like to to have a regular job anymore. And you know, I mean, where I'm not being attacked. You know, every day, every day, every day, just attacks, attacks, attacks. You know, people attacking me all over the place online, casting out my name as evil. And, He's a deceiver and all this stuff, and yet I'm telling the truth and the whole thing, you know. Um, and then spiritual attacks that come as a result of it. But uh, as time has gone by, I've seen the attacks have gotten a whole lot worse. Uh, just even in the world. I mean, the world condition right now is so much worse. I mean, back, like I said, when my grandfather was alive, um, when he died in 1991, he died and... Uh, and, I mean, it was like he was vexed by the how bad the world was. And I'm thinking, man, if we could only go back to 1991. <laughs> it was not that bad back then compared to today. And you think, what on earth is it going to be like another couple of years? You know, it's vexing. But the point is, um, it's getting to the point now where it's just like, you know, I have work to do and, and I'm trying. You know, I do a lot of things offline um, I don't really do any, I, I do, every once in a while I'll do something for money, 
other than ministry, uh, jobs or I'll sell something, fix up something and sell it. Uh, part of the reason I'm doing that is just to kind of maintain my sanity. Uh, it's full-time ministry, unless you've really been in it for quite a few years, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, the spiritual attacks that come on you is just unreal sometimes. And, uh, you know, and I'm finding that more and more, it's just like, I, I can't really take a whole lot of time off. And, uh, because there's just, the battle is heating up so much. And it's like the Lord expects me on the front lines of the battle, you know, preaching, teaching the word of God, answering people's questions and things. And I try my very best to do it. And, uh, you know, we're right in the middle of reorganizing this place and, and I'm building a lot and uh, you can't see it. I'm leaning right now. You see me doing this the whole way through the video. You're probably thinking, what the is he leaning on? There's a big table over here I just built, you know, moving bookshelves and moving all the books around and moving things and building this and building that. And um, we have a little over 12 inches of snow right now and, and the snow blower has been acting up and that, that we got and, and uh, you know, shoveling here is just uh, you know, very difficult. And so we got a snow blower and I've been fixing that. The, it had some problems. So I had to take the carburetor apart and, and, uh, cause I actually trained as a motorcycle mechanic years ago. Um, but another story, but there's all this work to do, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, I was starting to feel this, this weird spiritual attack stuff happening. And I'm like, Oh, you know, i I still got work to do. I'll, I'll do a video here and whatever. And uh, last night went to bed and uh, for fairly early for a change because I don't get a whole lot of sleep sometimes because I'm trying to get work done. And um, boy, it was about three o'clock, I guess, in the morning. I woke up and it was like I could just feel major, major, massive attack. And I was like, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I have to get down in there and I, I have to do a study. I have to spend some time in the Word of God with the Lord and I need to get this video idea that the Lord put in my mind and I'm kind of, how am I going to do this? So this sermon was written this morning, actually. I was going to say last night, but technically this morning, early, early this morning, from about uh, 3.30 to right around 5.30. So about two hours in the middle of the night. Um, I'm downstairs writing sermon notes. And... Um, why? Well, as time goes by and you're in ministry, you're going to have to make more and more sacrifices. That's part of the sanctification process. And um, the Lord will give you strength. You'll be surprised. Sometimes you'll get do something and you'll just think to yourself, man, I'm so wiped out and whatever else. And, and uh, the Lord will come along and He'll, he'll give you strength like you wouldn't believe. Um, I'll tell you this, and I can guarantee you this, uh, as a Christian... When you go through a real tough trial, a Job kind of an experience where things are really falling apart for you, and you come out of it without fully charging, charging foolishly charging the Lord, you come out and you say, Lord, what, I don't understand why this is happening, but I love you, Lord, and I understand you know what's going on. Uh, Romans 8.28 says that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. You come through it, and God will bless you. God will reward you greatly in this life too by the way in heaven yes in the millennial kingdom certainly but god will actually reward you right now you'll see it you'll feel great joy and by the way if you ever think to yourself you know i feel almost like i should pray for brother brian sister Catherine, and our son um but i think they're doing okay um uh we're doing we're we're okay you know and stuff we're surviving but uh, if you ever feel led to pray for us at any time of the day the holy spirit prompting you please pray okay uh, we desperately need it i mean there's a lot of stuff going on right now in this world and i don't even understand what all is going on but um you know i just just trying to get the point across here that that sacrifice will come in in ministry you know, and that is part of the sanctification process. And you have to present your body as a living sacrifice. And that's not always easy to do.
But let's continue. Second Timothy chapter two. So, you know, and another thing, I'll just tell you a little bit more of the story here. Um, uh, was it yesterday, I guess it was, or maybe the day before, I forget, but I had motor trouble with the snowblower. Took the carburetor all apart, you know, sitting out there and taking the thing apart and stuff, checking everything. Okay, was, all the jets clear and the bowl in the bottom and stuff. Is there any dirt in there? No, everything looked good. So cleaning out all the fuel lines and everything. I think I had ice in my fuel line coming from the gas tank down to the carburetor. But um, So I get the whole thing back together and uh, started up today. Everything's running great, doing a wonderful job. And stone lane and stone gets up in and jams itself in be behind the auger, basically the little, the blades inside the blower there, jams it in there and there's little bolts, you know, a shear bolt and it snaps it off now. So the one side of the snowblower doesn't work. <laughs> I'm just like going, oh. and say, like, okay, Lord, I'll go in, I'll do the study. Just, you know, <laughs> you'll see that as time goes by. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 19 through 21 says here, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and that every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. A changed life. Oh, imagine that. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these fleshly things, in other words, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. It is extremely important for you to sacrifice certain things in your life. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your health many times, which we're going to be talking about next. Sacrifice. Why? Because it's a sanctifying work. This vessel, this is a vessel right here. The Holy Spirit is poured into the vessel. You understand? Okay, if you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God. You don't have to seek Him by speaking in tongues or some other thing or whatever. You have the Holy Spirit of God if you're saved. Now, the Holy Spirit is, can only do things in your life depending on how much you've sanctified things you know, in your life. In other words, if you've still got problems and whatever else and you still have a cigarette smoking problem or you're looking at pornography and struggling with that or you've got other sin in your life, Notice I said that. I didn't say you live a sinless, perfect life if you're, if you're truly saved. I don't teach that. Never have. When you have sins in your life, you still are not a sanctified vessel. You still have to get that stuff out of your life. You have to make... And when you do, that's great. But then there's also the thing of sacrifices that come in. The Lord puts you into ministry and He says, Hey, I want you to go and do such and such. And you say, Well, Lord, that's going to take a lot of time. How am I going to get all that stuff done? I got other things to do here, and I got this to do, and I got that to do. You know, I mean, I should be going to the store right now to a dealership or something in the area to try and get the shear bolts to fix my snowblower so I can finish doing my lean. And it's just like, nope. I should have gotten a full night of sleep last night. Nope. Why? Because this has to be done. And the Lord, you'll get to that point where you'll understand when the Lord really wants you to do something, He will show it to you. He'll make it very clear. And he'll say, do this first. That will happen. You have to be a vessel unto honor. And the only way to do that is for you to sanctify your life by making sacrifices. But now we're going to move on to the final one here. This, I would say, is the highest level of sanctification. This is the one when you get through the others salvation, the new life, ministry. Lord trusts you with ministry and you have to make some sacrifices as a result. Now you get to the next one, which I believe is the final level of perfection. Sanctification. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. The final one is going to be your health. Hmm. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. I'm going to show you this.
It says here that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I've been over this one many, many times. I quote this scripture quite a bit because it's a very, very profound scripture. But I got to thinking about this and I thought, what did Jesus become on the cross? He became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took on the sins of the world upon himself. You know what one of the sins is out there? Hatred. Do you take on the sins of the lost world, them hating you, casting out your name as evil? You know, sometimes it gets very, very difficult. I can say this from experience. We have over a thousand videos now, moving towards 1,100 videos, and the hatred that I have from people. I mean, I, I grant you, I say some controversial things, and I can get people angry and stuff like this, but... My word, I mean, I can, I can put out a video, you know, my video on cures, you know, headache cures and remedies and things for Bible-believing Christians, and I get people hate me for doing a video like that. And I'm going, huh? You know, <laughs> the hatred that comes upon myself, my wife, the horrible things that have been said about us, and the, the videos that have been made, and people just hate my guts. They hate everything about me, you know, and you can feel that stuff coming upon you as a Christian. Just like Jesus Christ bore the sins of the world when he was dying on the cross there, he became sin. It's like when you get farther along in your life of, as a Christian, you get and your sanctification gets greater and greater and greater, you'll feel that hatred. You'll feel that evil just, just coming upon you and all these people that just hate the very air that you breathe. I mean, it's, it's incredible. What is it? The fellowship of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can get hated on a level right now as Bible-believing Christians. If you put videos out, you can be hated on a level that nobody could have dreamed of in the first century. A lot less people in the first century, and there was certainly no worldwide Internet ministry where people, anybody could get in there and write comments about you. I mean, we can, as Bible-believing Christians, we can get hated today. Just, it's amazing. The levels of hate that can come upon you as a Christian. And it isn't just like, oh, it doesn't bother me. You know, it's hard sometimes. It really is. And, you know, there's enough people out there that, that support the ministry and things and, and pray for us and, and, you know, write little testimonies and things. That, you know, I never understood this passage and your video really helped and uh, just got saved. And I thank the Lord for helping me to find your videos. And that stuff keeps me going. And that's, that's wonderful. I appreciate that. But I'll tell you right now, there's, there's a lot of times I can feel the hate. I can just feel how much people just despise me. You know, and it's, tone it down. <laughs> Brethren, I can tone it down. I can be as, just as nice as I can. And people still hate my guts. <laughs> so my method has always just been, I want to, you know, let me just explain this. For those of you who don't understand my sarcasm and some of my, what people perceive to be arrogance and things like this. Um, I want people to know what I believe. I don't believe in being politically correct for any reason. Um, I believe in being blunt and brutally honest and just coming out with it. And uh, if you're wanting the truth, you're going you're gonna to see past some of my sarcastic ways and whatever else, or you'll enjoy it if you're a Bible believer. Most Bible believers I know of have sort of a weird sarcastic sense of humor. You know, the Lord does. I've uh, talked about that in other studies, but you're going to understand things. And if you're lost, I've gotten things from lost people. I've gotten stuff from Roman Catholics, and they're like, you know what, I don't agree with what you're saying, but I, I do feel that you love people. Thank you. So you're thinking a Roman Catholic? Yes, I am. I thank you because you understand my spirit. You understand when I come out and I say Roman Catholicism is wicked, it's satanic and things like this. I'm not saying it because I hate Roman Catholics. I don't hate Roman Catholics. I don't hate Muslims. I don't hate sodomites. I don't hate atheists. I don't hate anybody. I don't. I have strong disagreements with what you're doing. And I'm going to make my strong disagreements known and plain so that you're not wondering, well, he's kind of ambiguous. I'm not ambiguous. All right? That's not going to happen. 
But coming out with the truth, as I do, is going to get you hated. It's going to get a lot of people coming after you. Lines up with uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Let me show you another one. Psalm 38. Back to the Old Testament. You could call this the sixth psalm. Psalm 38, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Again, you know, I'll, I'll say this. I lived a life of sin for a long, long time. And I ate the wrong kind of foods, and I looked at the wrong kind of stuff with my eyes. So a lot of times I'm in pain, and I'm just like, you know what, Lord, why do I have a headache, or why is this wrong with me, or that wrong with me? And the Lord reminds me, you wrecked your health for, you know, over 30 years, you know, and, and you're doing okay now with natural health and stuff, but you wrecked your health for a long time, you know, and you lived in sin for a long time. So, you know, maybe you ought to shut up a little bit about the chastening, you know. Uh, and I go, oh, yeah, sorry about that, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Um, verse 4, for mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Yeah. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it, is, it also is gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Part of sanctification. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things, and imagine deceits all the day long. Brian Denlinger exposed. <laughs> yeah. Verse 13, But I as a deaf man heard not, and I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I did this video years ago. I got angry about the thing of Greg Miller. I mean, he was putting stuff in the comments section. You know, people say, well, you're, you're okay with Ruckman, but you're not okay with Greg Miller. Ruckman never said the kind of stuff that Greg Miller has said. Sexually perverted things and, and using language that was just really inappropriate. I mean, I had to take the comment section down and delete his comments. It was that bad. I'm just like, I don't want the lost world even seeing this stuff. It was, it was foul. And I've had people write to me and say, you know, I just asked him a question. I just said something that he disagreed with, and he just, like, ripped into me. Uh, I never saw Ruckman do that, okay? Um, but I remember I did this video, and I was very angry, and I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I was like, it's the Bible, it's the Bible, it's the Bible, and I'm hitting the Bible. And, you know, I was mad. I shouldn't have been hitting the Bible. I apologize for that. I took the video down. But these stinking hypocrites, there they are. Uh, they also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. They take one little clip of a video where I lost my temper, and it's just like all over the internet. One mistake. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have lost my temper like that. But now it's a Brian Ellinger exposed, and they show other video where I'm saying, don't ever hit your Bible. Yeah, I made a mistake. I messed up. I make mistakes in the ministry. I don't try to go up and cover up and stuff like this so people think I'm perfect. I make mistakes. You know, I make mistakes all the time with my health. And I suffer for it. You know, I have a, a great weakness for chocolate. And I get headaches if I eat too much chocolate before I go to bed. And I try not to. I go for a long time sometimes without eating chocolate. But, you know, 
Sometimes I eat chocolate and I wake up and I have a headache all day. It's stupid. Why do I do a thing like that? You know? They'll do the same thing with you. As you get further along the line of sanctification. Verse 17. For I am ready to halt and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Yeah. But mine enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. It's amazing how a lot of these great Bible-believing ministries that come out against me and show me to be the heretic that I supposedly am, they'll, magna they'll uh, monetize their, their channels and things, and they get their subscriber base goes through the roof. You know, they, uh, they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. I've never monetized my account, nor will I ever, you know. It's crazy. Verse 20, They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. That's the prayer you're going to get to. That's, that's where you're going to get to is you get in to later on, you know, parts of your life where the sanctification starts to happen, where you're starting to suffer. You feel the hatred from the people that just can't stand you. You know, I mean, I've been doing this thing since 2007, 2008 on the internet, but uh, 2007, um, so it's going to be 10 years next year of being in very, very hardcore ministry. Uh, not backing down from very many subjects. Um, if Lord shows me something, or now that my wife has joined the ministry a number of years ago, Lord shows us something, we'll bring it out, no matter what it costs. And uh, we pay a high price for that. We really do. Um, my wife has been in very, very good health, and uh, she's even started to feel some weird things just going wrong with her health. And she's like, I don't understand. We're eating the right thing. We're eating the same stuff we've always eaten. And, you know, am I doing something wrong here? And I'm like, no, honey, that's what happens. Your health failing will be the final level of sanctification. I'm going to show you that here in just a couple minutes. Actually, you know what? I'm going to show it to you right now. Just looking at my notes there and going, oh, yeah, actually, we're there now. Second Corinthians chapter 12. There's going to be times that you're going to have sleepless nights. I've talked about this. I had a dear brother and the Lord send me this information about what to do to get good nights of sleep and stuff. I've done all that stuff. Uh, I eat the right things and do the right things and, you know, all this different stuff. Doesn't matter. There's times we'll do the same things two nights in a row. Same basic, you know, good eating meal and then we have the same stuff before we go to bed or just nothing at all. or with the Same things. One night it'll be wonderful, amazing sleep. The next night, there'll be barely any sleep. Weird, horrible nightmares the whole way through the thing or something. So, you know, struggling. Uh, sometimes that you're going to struggle with the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. You ready? I'm telling you, this is the final level of sanctification. If you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with some kind of health issue that's ministry related, that's because of your sanctified life that you've been set apart from the lost world and things are not seeming to get any better, Here's some encouragement for you. Verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength. How do you get God's strength? Sanctification. Salvation. A new life. Ministry. Sacrifice. Your health failing. My strength is made 
perfect in weakness. You say, well, I'm not really there yet. I'm, I don't, I'm in pretty good health. Keep going. And you'll start to feel it. You say, well, can I, can I avoid this whole thing of this, all this bad stuff that could happen in my life and feeling down and feeling depressed and health problems and whatever else? Now, and and I, I don't even talk about a lot of my health problems. You know, again, it's something I'd, I feel like, you know, there's probably, I don't know if there's people putting, I, I've actually been told that there are people that are putting curses on us and stuff like this. And I've gotten threats and things like this. We're going to, you know, witches, or we're going to put hexes on you and whatever else. And, and I don't talk about a lot of things because I don't want them thinking, oh, we're winning or stuff like this. But we have some weird stuff go wrong with us. Just unexplainable, weird things. <laughs> You know, I can relate to a lot of what David was writing back there in Psalm 38 and uh, just odd things. You're going, what in the world's going on? <laughs> you know, but uh, understanding that God's strength can only come when we are in a weak state. Let me ask you a convicting question. When do you pray more? When you're in good health or poor health? Poor health. You know you do. When you're really hurting and when you're really suffering, you'll be praying a lot. Things are really going good. You don't pray quite as much, do you? What's Paul's reaction to this? Same thing we should react. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. That's the final level of sanctification, brethren. When you have nothing left to give up for the Lord, when He sanctified out of your life all the worldly stuff, the movies, the music, the worldly dress, the worldly talk, the worldly mindset. The Lord's got everything in your life. And then your health starts to fail. And you're down on your knees and you're going, God, I don't know what in the world is going on here. I didn't do a thing. I don't know why I have a headache. God, I don't know why I'm not sleeping at night. Why is, am I having these depression problems? Why am I this? Why am I that? The Lord says, because right now I'm going to give you my strength. What an encouraging thought. As your health starts to fail, as you're going down like this, the Lord will come along and He'll say, Here, let me help you. I'll give you my strength. And you can only experience that power when you're weak. It's made perfect in weakness. And I know, I, I wish I could just help people. I know a lot of you struggle. I know a lot of you write me and just say, Brother Brian, could you please pray for whatever problem? I, I'm really having struggles here. I'm really having some problems. Yeah, I understand. And we're going to continue here in just a minute. I'm going to talk to you about the rest that comes when we get rest from this whole thing. It's going to be the final part. But let's look at another scripture here quickly. Kind of rabbit trailing a little bit here on my notes, but this is a very near and dear subject to my heart because it used to be I can say, you know, I don't understand what, why is this stuff happening? And question, you know, am I am I doing something wrong? Am I, is that why I'm having this thing happen here? Or did I eat the wrong thing or whatever? Look at this, First Peter chapter four verse twelve. It says here, beloved, th beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye, sh ye may be exceeding, excuse me, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God 
on this behalf. How contrary to what modern Christianity is all about. Modern Christianity is all about eliminating suffering. Coming to a nice building with all the nice heat and all the nice lighting and all the nice programs that they put on and the nice padded pews and the nice everything. Programs for the children, programs for the adults, classes, seminars, all the stuff. It's all made to eliminate suffering. Let's not preach about controversial things that will make you feel uncomfortable. Let's not talk about your sins. If you've believed in Jesus, that's all it takes. You see? They are taking away suffering so that you will never experience the power of God. It's really something. Finally, let's talk about rest. I did something kind of a little bit interesting in this study. Uh, a lot of times when I do a study, a word study, we'll actually look at the first time it's mentioned. Go in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. Turn back. The very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2. This time I did it backwards. We're going to end. I've got two other scriptures to turn to here, but the last final part of this study, we're going to talk about the rest that comes when we have rest from our labor that we did. And we're going to look at the first time that the word sanctified is mentioned in the King James Bible. Sanctified is all throughout the Old Testament. Sanctification is only in the New Testament. Interesting there. But check this out. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. First time the word shows up. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. You say, you see, God rested the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Now is that true? Yeah, it is. But look at the peculiar wording of the verse. That in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Let me show you what I believe is going on here. Change the wording just a little bit. I'm not saying the Bible should rewritten, be rewritten just to help you understand. Who's the he? He had rested from all his work. I believe it's talking about a saved person. Think about it. How could it be God? Let's read it with the word God in there. Because that in it, God had rested from all God's work, which God created and made. But let's read it now as a Christian here. Because that in it, the saved man, we'll say saved instead of Christian, the saved man rested from all the saved man's work, which God created and made. Interesting. You see, the millennial kingdom that's coming is when we are going to receive our rest. When we're going to be in an incorruptible body, which we receive at the rapture. We're not going to have to worry about those physical problems, the bad health. We will be completely sanctified at that point in time. We'll be a pure vessel, meat for the master's use. We will have our rest. And it's ironic because the Lord could just take us to eternity and we just be up there and that's it and whatever. But the Lord's actually going to bring us back down to the earth. Hmm. So we can experience life here on the earth, but completely 100% sanctified. We will receive a time of rest. I'll show you the New Testament tie-in. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2, verse 11. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It is a faithful saying that you don't have to worry about this promise being broken. In other words, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, he shall also reign with, or we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. You can live your life down here as a Christian and just do it for yourself and never worry about sanctification. Just push sanctification out of your life 
and just get by by the skin of your teeth. Go to the judgment seat of Christ and watch all your works burned up. But you're not going to reign with Jesus Christ for the millennial kingdom. Or you can choose to do right. And you can choose to say, you know what, Lord? I don't know, even know what all it's going to cost me. But at whatever it is, whatever price I have to pay, I'm willing to pay it. Whatever pain, whatever suffering I have to go through, when I start to have things go wrong with my health that I can't explain, I won't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that's trying me. I'll understand your strength is made perfect in my weakness. I'll understand, hey, this stuff I'm going through, it's because God wants to show me His power. He wants to give me millennial reign. That's going to be the time of my rest. Yes, you still have to think about rest. You still have to think about good health. Don't You can't just, you know, let that stuff go. But uh, you're not going to live in perfect health and have a perfect time down here on this earth if you want God's power. Your rest is going to come in the millennial kingdom. Finally, we're going to turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. A lot of Christians don't like the persecution that comes with the cross of Christ. They try to pretty it up. You can't. A homeless Jew that was not educated, dying naked on a cross, beat to within an inch of his life, blood all over the place, beard ripped out, dying, bleeding. You can't pretty that up. Lost World doesn't want to hear about that. These atheists out there, these people that hate God, they don't want to think about a man having to be tortured to death to pay for their wickedness. They don't like that. You will be persecuted for your stands for the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Yeah, they'll try to bring you into their religious system. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Sanctified. Different from the world. People look at you as strange. Why does that old man, why is he different than other people? I didn't understand back as a teenager. I didn't understand a lot about my grandfather. I didn't understand. I thought Grandpa might be going a little bit senile when he told us that last Christmas. I won't be here next year. My grandpa had, an, he had a relationship with the Lord where I believe the Lord told him, you're going to be coming home soon. That's a strong relationship. But you only get that through, thank, through sanctification. He was a new creature in Christ Jesus. He was different than the lost world. Verse 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them in mercy and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Do you have things in common with Jesus Christ? You should, if He's your Savior. Verse 18, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, Amen. Amen. It's a very uh, convicting study. Because I'll tell you, it's rough sometimes. 
and um, you know, I just there's so much I could say. You know, I keep going on and on and on here, but I'm gonna end this sermon, this study. But uh, I just really feel like the Lord needed me to get this thing done, and um, you know, please, please pray for us because it is it is rough sometimes. You know, going through these things, and I mean, this world is just getting so vile. I mean, you know, you're you're feeling it out there, and I, I we pray every night, you know, for a lot of the members of the body of Christ and and um, those that are going through some stuff, and you know, we have a lot of people on our list, and and I think about people and I wonder how they're doing, and and uh, it's all part of the sanctification process. And you have to remember that. Um, don't think it's some strange thing that's happened to you if you're struggling in this life. Uh, the Lord will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. Remember that. But will with the temptation make a way to escape, make a way out, that ye may be able to bear it. Remember that. So, <laughs> I keep saying stuff, but uh, I hope that this has been a challenge to you. Um, because I know that there are times, I, like I said, that people struggle. People have problems and they write me and I don't have a real good solution. And it's just like, just stick with it. Okay? So uh, that's going to be it. Um, please keep us in your prayers. Um, thank you all to all those that donate to the ministry. I always like to say that you know, on occasion. Um, but uh, just really, really pray for us. Because it does get rough at some times. And um, so I think I'll quit talking now. Thank you very much for watching. And we will see you in the next video. I'm not sure when I'm going to be getting back to the Revelation study. Because we are trying to get stuff done here. But I'll keep you updated. You'll be updated. I have some neat ideas coming up for videos. We still have some big projects we're working on. Uh, having to put some things aside right now because of the reorganization here. And of course now winter's here. So... Uh, we always have that as a responsibility as well, the keeping things cleaned up here and stuff, you know, snow-wise and stuff. So that is going to be it. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for watching.